Welcome to an episode of Catching Up With on the Marshall Pruitt Podcast, brought to you by Cooper Tires and the Justice Brothers. We're speaking with the awesome Jenna Ricker, director of Qualified, brand new ESPN 30 for 30 documentary debuts Monday, May 28th at 8 p.m. on ESPN, and then re-airs shortly after. Also speak with one of her producers, Greg Stewart, sitting down with the two of them at the Indy 500. It was fascinating to learn about the motivations behind creating this documentary on Janet Guthrie and how Qualified came together, the decision-making process on what to include, the angles that they brought forth, all of Janet's background directly from her, a lot of the rather amazing obstacles that she faces in a modern society today, unfathomable, but at least back in the 1970s and early 1980s when Janet was making her impression as the first woman to qualify and compete in the Indianapolis 500, she indeed was subjected to behavior that would just be simply hard to accept in 2019. Spent a decent amount of time with Jenna and Greg and really do appreciate not only their time but their expertise. Having watched Qualified, it is a fine, fine piece of documentary film. So I'm hoping you'll enjoy it here on Memorial Day, 8 p.m., debuting on ESPN. Qualified, the latest addition to their 30 for 30 series. So off we go with Jenna Ricker, director of Qualified, and Greg Stewart, one of the producers for the documentary on the Marshall Pruitt Podcast, brought to you by Cooper Tires and the Justice Brothers. Jenna Ricker, Greg Stewart, so happy that we are here talking about ESPN 30 for 30 documentary coming out May 28th, I believe. That's right. Titled Qualified, about someone who has been long overdue for not only a proper documentary like the one you all helped create, Jenna, you directed, Greg, you helped produce. Having watched it late last night, was so happy to see that Janet Guthrie is being honored her story is being told for not just those who might know the name, but told in a way that isn't meant to be too inside baseball, something that maybe folks who didn't know a thing about her might have cause to realize American badass, American legend, you bet. maybe bringing her to a new audience, but also to those maybe even in the sport like myself who didn't know all the nuances. Where did this idea come from? Um, well, first of all, I just want to say we're super excited to be talking with you. Uh, well, you're fans. silly, but thank you. Big fans. Um, so this idea came from the fact that uh, en route to the Indy 500 a few years back, I said to Greg, I know Danica wasn't the first and Pippa and Sarah and all these amazing contemporary female racers, but I said, uh, who was the first? And I recollected Lynn St. James was mm. as far as I, as I got and Greg immediately said, Janet Guthrie, 1977. And that began a search for me about her story. And uh, she wrote an amazing autobiography that she was bringing a typewriter to the tracks with her and recording her experiences. And then, you know, after her career had ended, she went back and, and wrote this book. And it was a page turner. And it was so insightful into the aspects of racing that I wasn't even familiar with. And uh, that, and thus began the desire to get her story out there. Greg, knowing your history, not only on the film production side, but also as the hardcore racing fan, wow. uh, I'm sure you would spend all of your You're days... You're a hardcore racing fan. Well, I'm, I'm <laughs> uh, but someone who knows his history knows, knows what this sport is. Did Janet stand out to you just over the years among various thoughts and projects that, boy, if this ever came up, this would be a fantastic no. topic? No. I mean, honestly, it, I, I, you know, as a kid following racing, for me, for whatever reason, she just seemed she seemed like another driver. And I, I didn't really think about it uh, as a potential for a great story until Jenna read, read her autobiography. And uh, as Jenna said, the autobiography is excellent. It's very cinematic. There's so many dramatic ups and downs. Um, and then you brought up before, you know, there are things that even as a racing fan, I didn't realize about Janet. And, and one of the biggest things was her NASCAR history, which for some reason at the time didn't really register with me. Um, and she had a strong showing in NASCAR. And again, for her, it was it was brand new. I mean, her first NASCAR race uh, that she competed in, 
uh, was the first one she'd ever seen, you know, in person. So it's pretty phenomenal. Uh, it's and it's a pretty dramatic story and and uh, um, full of full of surprises. I think even if you're a racing fan, Jenna, looking at the general theme that I think is woven from the beginning of the documentary, and I realize that we're committing somewhat of the cardinal radio sin of talking about pictures and visions that can't be seen, but just trying to at least get folks up to speed of what they can expect. We have someone in Janet who was raised in a time where she's receiving comments when she's wanting to get into racing and do some of these things uh, where she decides to go to college. And one of the comments was if she actually is here thinking she wants to get an education, she doesn't understand that really this is a place that women go in this era to look for a husband called a Mrs. Degree. This is a very different time. So maybe for a pick the age, a 15-year-old girl, a 25-year-old woman watching this today, I'm guessing there would be this rather surreal transportation back to a time where, wait a minute, this phenomenally talented person was in an era where those talents really were never considered. It's just how you look and how you might find a man Tell us about making sure you preserve that reality and not trying to brush that away because that would fit modern sensibilities. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, it it was so prevalent uh, in the archive. I guess let me just take a step back for a minute. One of the goals for me uh, as a filmmaker approaching this project was to see first how much we could tell archivally which we ended up telling the whole film archivally except for the contemporary interviews. Uh, And part of the reason was to preserve what you're saying, really, and to show people, like, she was part of the zeitgeist at the time. She was all over the news. And yet today, obviously, people don't, many people don't know who she is. Um, So to present her in that era and at that time, you couldn't escape so much of the limitations that were placed on women or the boxes they were placed in and and preferred to remain in um, by society. And so it became a natural way to tell her story. Uh, certainly as a contemporary you know, audience member, a young woman perhaps, I do think there's a shock value and it's probably good mm. that they're a little shocked by the fact that you know, the idea of college was to get a husband. Um, I mean, there were other elements that once you have to make tough choices in the edit room, you know, you have to leave behind. But there was, you know, one of her friends who's in the film, a woman by the name of Pam Mooney, she talks about how, you, you know, you had to get your husband to help you sign for a credit card, how young women today wouldn't even understand <laughs> so much of these things. Yeah, you couldn't do it yourself. And um, so it, it does... I think to understand just even an an ounce of what Janet was up against coming into, you know, the top levels of motorsport, you had to understand what the expectations of women were at that time. Greg, looking at Janet in this documentary and how she presents herself, she is very laid back, reserved. She is just herself she's my favorite kind of human being in that she owns who she is she doesn't try and put on something different for effect she just is this is what i am that's all i'm going to try and be and what i love about that and what i'd love to hear your thoughts on in what you've created here with qualified is this is someone who had desires that did not fit what was expected for gender norms instead of getting into a very contentious life and cycle where it was every day fighting against this and that and having this fighter's mentality she at least i believe just brought a no this is me and natural i'm just going to do it if you have issues you deal with them on your own because they're yours did you recognize that during the the filmmaking process and how did you make sure that that came through the way that it has well uh, you know as jenna's mentioned you start digging into the archival and i think we were all curious how uh, when when questions were being fired at her, when criticism was being fired at her, how she responded, and man oh man, you're right, she's just level-headed, straight, direct. You know, uh, she often says, "I stood on my record," and uh, what she had done in the in, in the early uh, sports car racing days of building her own engines and being her own crew, working her way up 
Um, as we talked about a little bit uh, before we started, Marsha, you made a great point. She does make quite a leap from the kinds of sports cars she was racing to Indy. But even for her, I mean, for her at that time, it, you know, I, th- I think she understood it was a leap, but I think she also felt like I'm a race car driver and I want, if I have the opportunity to race in this kind of equipment, I'm going to approach it like I approach every other race. And, and she is exactly who she is. I mean, she, she, she didn't want to make a big deal about it. We talk about it in the film, she's a very reluctant feminist. Yes. Uh, that wasn't part of her uh, push. Um, I think she embraced it as she realized she was having an impact uh, uh, with women. Um, but uh, her personality, as it comes through in the film, is pretty fascinating and, and very, very level. Um, uh, just an interesting character. And in so many ways, the uh, or that level-headedness that Janet brings her is is what how she succeeds. I can't imagine doing what she did and letting your emotions sort of override. Uh, I mean, she had the emotions. She would have some moments to, her, to herself that were tough. But when it came to getting, she said to us, you know, getting in the car was the easy part. Getting to the car with all the microphones in her face and everything that was the part that. You you know, had nothing to do with her and everything to do with everybody else. For her, it was get the helmet on, get in the car. I can prove it on the racetrack. And that level-headedness, I think, is her was her secret weapon, really. I mean, you think about her pushing up, you know, to, to qualify and people yelling things and dealing with all this criticism. But just when she got in the car everything went away and she you know she just became a driver and which is interesting because it's a very common uh thing that you hear from all the other drivers you know it's no different than the male drivers that sort of approach where you get in the car and the focus is just on that vision and it's it's one of the things the first my first indy 500 one of the things i came away with was what is the mindset of a racer because they have so much happening at once and to focus the way they focus with all the input and output was magical to me. I mean, it was epic. And then later on, after my experience of Indy, getting to know Janet and how she did it, it just, it was like getting an inside look at the mentality. And she said, look, we're lone wolves and we're focused and we're, once it all goes away, once that helmet goes on and just amazing to me. When I look at the most incredible part of her story, which you mentioned, she does her best to present her qualifications as someone who is a champion in sports car racing. She competed at Sebring and here and there in big international sports car races in the same field, competing against Mario Andretti and many others. There's a little bit of, of saleswomanship there in the fact that, yes, she was in those races, but she was not in those big 200-mile-an-hour Ferraris or name some of the, these, the vehicles that, say, a Mario was driving. She was in comparatively tiny cars, little small things that could barely get out of their own way. And none of what I just said is critical of Janet. I hope it sells the point that her experience, the championships that she won were in mild, lightly modified commuter cars to go from these little shit boxes to the Indy 500 is just, it is, it does not make any sense. It's something the average person would say, no, I'm not going to do that. There's no chance I would consider doing that because it should take five maybe 10 years of working up from step to step to step to the mountaintop and not just from i'm not talking risk or anything else it's just a talent development it's like saying my kid who is in junior high who's great at basketball is going to be starting tonight playing for the golden state warriors in the playoffs and you go what right where's college where's high school to think that she made this massive leap with nothing in between and then on top of that as if that wasn't ridiculous enough she does it with one of the smallest most underfunded uh, lots of spirit but not lots of aptitude or depth we're just talking things where you go this should be absolute failure no matter what and yet she showed in a reasonable amount of time she not only belonged but could compete 
That's crazy. Yeah, I'm so glad you bring that up because it, it really is something that we can we didn't have enough time to go as d- as deep in uh, in the dock, but it is true. She makes this massive leap, and one of the one of the things about her ultimate performance was that she was always contending with subpar equipment. So from the from the road racing days where she's not in the Porsches and the Ferraris, um, all the way through her Indian NASCAR career, it was always subpar equipment. And if there's one thing in particular that I think became a strength of hers was that she could get the most out of the equipment that she had. But to make that leap is huge. And you're right, it is that your comparison's great. It's like it is like, you know, your high schooler going to the pros. It just was a massive leap, you know, and as Greg pointed out earlier, you know, her first NASCAR race, the World 600 at Charlotte Motor Speedway, is her first time she's seen a NASCAR race. It's her first time driving uh, one of those cars and going into it with two days of practice. So there was something about Janet that was above the average in terms of her ability at the end of the day, but her trajectory was r- a ridiculous leap. And mind, whatever that means, seemed to adapt very quickly. Uh, yeah. From, from style of car to, to style of car, you know. Um, I mean, you know, when we were talking with AJ about NASCAR, for example, he was like, yeah, those things were hard to move. Like, it was hard for me to move those cars, you know. And here she is, you know, again, stepping into a world she doesn't know with equipment she's never taken on. And there was something in her engineering mind, perhaps, that could just lock in and focus and then ultimately perform. But I do, you know, having done the, the research and, and everything, you do appreciate the resistance to her as not, it was more than just being a woman. For some of them, it was, wait a second, this is a big leap. Yeah, it's, a, for others, it's a fair criticism. It is a fair uh, criticism. I think for others, a woman was just not going to be accepted, period. And that's a different, right. you know, mindset. But for others, there was a legit concern. You know, Tom Bigelow is saying, you know, where did she come from? What did she done? What's going on here? Um, but, yeah, it's really great. You know, I'm, I'm glad you're bringing it up, too, because I think it's an important thing that we're not able to go as depth, as deep in the, in the dock as we would have liked to. But appreciating what she did, it, it really stands out. Yeah, as much as it is a criticism, as you bring up, Marshall, it is to her credit that she was able to make that leap and, and be competitive for the car she was driving. Yeah. Another thing that might be interesting to explore as we wind down just a little bit is you mentioned the pushback. There were some of the headlines, some of the clippings that you found of the time you just brought forward to 2019, there would be no sports writers left at most magazines because right. every headline is a hashtag me too movement right. of some sort. It's, right. it's just, you go, it's amazing to think that men writing, editors editing, publishers publishing, saying, oh yes, these headlines, not just, we're not talking about is she talented enough, it's a woman in a race car, what is this world coming to? Uh, uh, The head of the Speedway, Mr. Holman, this big debate that gets brought forth in the documentary of well, how will we present this? This this is breaking tradition. It's gentlemen start your engines, and how should we accommodate this? And there is the change it right. There's the and there's, again, we're not trying to give away everything in it, but there's this great question of well, uh, if you want to get technical, there might be a woman driving a car for the first time, but technically men start the cars, of which the team says, aha, well we got you covered there too. It's just things where you go. If you were here, if you were born in that era, you you would understand that. You, one of the things in getting older, in relearning our parents as we get older, is you try not to, for the most part, convict them for their era. Right. And so yeah. what I appreciate about what you've presented and qualified is you've presented an accurate portrayal of the time without being judgmental. You've just laid that out. But what I'd love to hear, uh, Greg, if you could, is thinking about what you have to present here. This question of a woman on a racetrack with men. Is she physically fit enough? 
Will she panic because women are no, prone to hysteria, as the whole world knows? Well, you know, all of these crazy stereotypes that aren't just evaluated, but actually play a central role in wondering if this woman is just this fragile little thing that just go ahead and play for a little bit, but come off track and let the men actually do what they do. How do you present that without driving home hard convictions of the times the people, some of the folks interviewed, uh, to not make this a fight documentary, but just a truth documentary. Well, one of the interesting things about documentaries is that when you go in, you have a sense of what the story is, but you don't know until you get into the edit what the real story is and how things are going to slowly emerge from the archival. I think one of the things Jenna did really well in putting, and her editor put, did really well putting the film together is picking uh, the elements from the archive that do highlight some of the attitudes and opinions of the time from other drivers uh, and then using the contemporary conversations and interviews that we conducted uh, to, to help uh, f- find places where those comments resonate a little bit more. Uh, putting that combination together in a way that is pretty straight storytelling with some surprises and twists and turns, but doesn't, uh, isn't overly opinionated. You could shape it in a certain way and make it very didactic and, and you know, really press home certain issues if you have your own agenda, you know, you want to drive through. But uh, I think this, the nice thing about this film is that the audience gets to sit back and sort of pick up on things, and it slowly evolves, uh, you know, and, and people are going to feel differently about it. You know, one person can feel one way, one person can feel another way. But we just let the, uh, the film sort of speaks for itself, uh, I think, in that sense. And there isn't an attempt to make a feminist film or a condemnation of the 70s film. Even some of her supporters back then, like you're saying, they would toss out things now and then that today we would question and those are people who are on her side oh that girl can drive you know I mean, we can get Bill Vukovic here to <laughs> eat his hat as he promised to do right. Vuki will show up and I mean, do he was that. great but he's a perfect example of someone who kind of evolved, his opinion evolved as, as time uh, went by and he got to know her as a racer but you know one of the things that was important was you know if you're honoring Janet and her story and you're presenting what she went through this is what she was dealing with we can react to it you know as an audience we can go oh Ah, I can't believe they said that. Did they really say that to her? Did they really say that about her? But if we sort of comment on it, I think we get in the way of the of the audience experiencing what she was up against and, and the sort of insidious nature of it. And, and like you said, part of the time period. And if you're going to present the story as it was happening, that's part of the story. And less important that we comment on it, more important you experience as a viewer, oh my God, did they really say that? Was that really in the papers? You know, and, and I felt like we, were, we just so lucked out with the archive we found, including her home movies, where we just couldn't believe you had access to that. Um, but yeah, it was... It was important to to have the audience walk away with the experience versus us tell them what we want them to experience. Some of the articles and writings, I mean, there's so many, so many, um, you know, quote unquote humorists of the time saying things like, "Oh, well, the Indy 500 is going to start, but." Janet will be fishing through her purse for her car keys and things like that. And, so. you know, there's things, too, like like Jane Polly, who interviewed her in 77, who really was a fan. And, again, it's so of the era. Jane Polly asked her if she was going to put makeup on before the race. And, you know, it's we, there's, like I, there's a lot we had to leave on the cutting room floor. But at some point, the archives is doing the work for us. And you let that comment. Let's close on two things. Uh, I'll avoid getting into the sponsorship side. That's a big part of the movie, but I think that'll just be interesting for folks to find on their own. Here's it debuts on May 28th. So you have, Jenna, in terms of a subject in Janet Guthrie, you do have a true maverick, right? And I would hesitate to say to limit that to sporting maverick that's what the documentary is ultimately about that's how she is known but this is a woman who is an aerospace engineer this is a woman who is not only an amateur race car driver and then becomes a professional race car driver more or less on her own 
tuning her car, prepping her car, towing her car. This isn't someone coming from, although her family was not poor, she did not come from wealth and means, so it's extravagant vehicles, lots of folks helping. This is truly just a woman, honestly a bit of an alien, right? In this era, she is just her damn self doing the things that she likes, that she's very good at doing. How do you present this maverick in a sporting documentary for ESPN, the world leader, but do something very different than most 30 than 30s, in that in most 30 for 30s, there's a lot of great storytelling and such, but depth of the character outside of their sporting fame or recognition not often a component. Here, you actually really made an effort to say, don't look at her as a singular entity. This is a woman who is vastly accomplished, and she's amazing at race car driving. How'd you do that? Because that's not normal for 30 for 30s. Wow, that's quite a compliment. Thank you. Um, you know, she, she, as you said when we first started talking, Janet Guthrie is Janet Guthrie. She's who she is. She's the contemporary Janet at 81 years old is the same woman who was on the side in pit row talking to interviewers. You know, she was always in her own skin, which is so admirable. Um, I think that it's funny you bring up Maverick because I think she would, would say, I wasn't a Maverick. I was a racer who wanted to shot at the game. And that is, in and of itself, makes her stand out. Um, I think that it was important to understand uh, in introducing her to a wider audience, perhaps, or reintroducing her to people who may have forgotten uh, what she accomplished, that this was a woman who was ahead of her time, in a way, outside of the norm from the very beginning. You know, um, you know, we discuss your childhood in the film, and I won't highlight things so that people can be surprised and, and find out in the film. But she was always testing the limits of human capability, which is something she talks about a lot herself. And you know, in and of it just just to have that mindset, this was the woman. This, she was born with that. She was always gonna push it, whatever field she went to. And uh, I think that for so many uh, people who've seen the film, what they've said is this transcends a sport. Like this woman and what she did transcends the sport. And she's telling my story. There's a lot of men and women, uh, women rather, and men who have said, that's my story. I have to keep pushing to be taken seriously. I have to keep pushing the, the rock up the mountain myself to be validated for my accomplishments and I do think it's a very human experience and to see that Janet was doing this 40 plus years ago and you look at racing today if you just take racing and you say God we still have some needles to move here you know with accepting and and backing women as a legit competitor there might be one woman in the field this year if she if she makes a field there might 40 years later there might be one yeah. Huge change. And, and I think that was one of the aspects of approaching the film and really bringing Janet to the foreground and what she did is that, you know, in so many ways, she was, she did this massive thing and we still, it, it resonates today that we still have a long way to go. Um, but she's so inspirational in her single mindedness of what she wanted to do. Like you said, I mean, she went broke building her own cars. She gave up a, a very good career in aerospace engineering to pursue this field of racing where there was no woman in her at her time who was like a roadmap for how to do this. So she was really trailblazing in that sense. And uh, it was an honor and a privilege to get to know her and to bring this story out. And I hope that, again, racers, non-racers alike find uh, that inspiration in her that if you want to do something you just you buckle down and you do it you find a way let's close on this this 30 for 30 series has been amazing for many years lots and lots of stick and ball not a lot of motor racing 
what feedback have you gotten just internally from ESPN, maybe from, I don't know if Janet has, has weighed in seeing it, just share some thoughts if you've gotten a feel on where ESPN might feel this sits among this amazing library of 30 for 30 documentaries and some other feedback you've gotten, just so maybe folks have a feel for at least what others have said in seeing it before it debuts. Uh, certainly. Well, um, you know, we've had a tremendous support from ESPN and, uh, you know, Janet herself, when she watched it, said that it took two hours for her heart rate to come back down <laughs> and that she was just over the moon with how it turned out. And there's so much she had not ever seen that was in it and so much she'd not heard from other drivers and people who were talking in the film. And I think she was very touched by that. Um, I think what we have heard, and Greg certainly can weigh in on this, but from audiences and people at ESPN is that This is not their usual story. This is not the usual style um, with all the archive and and or story that they have focused on. And it was one of the reasons they got really excited about doing it was here's um, a female, which is another area that they haven't they haven't been able to spend this kind of care or whatever, like nurturing of women's stories. And here they are. They have this great opportunity, this great female, you know, icon and racing which you know they've covered for years but have not really had there's not very many right ESPN 30 for 30s on racing right Tim Richmond stands Tim Richmond. out yeah that's one which is good. great I might be forgetting one other but it's but it's, it's not one of those a, things where yeah. you get up you tell all your friends oh there's a racing one coming yes. oh my goodness right I mean I think you could do an entire series uh, you, there, you would be you couldn't exhaust the amount of racing stories about between the racers the fans the actual sport itself it's tremendous I mean that was a, certainly a takeaway yeah I totally agree I mean it's such a rich world there's so many great characters uh, you know it, it's a there. I mean, you could go on and on and on with individual stories, individual drivers, specific races, uh, car builders. Uh, you know, it, it's fascinating. You know, to me, I wish there were more. Um, hopefully, uh, you know, people look at this and 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 they see that. And uh, um, I think it, it it's good for the sport, but it's also good, as he said, like the best of the thirty for thirty sort of transcend to the sport, and you learn something not to sound corny, but about the human condition and about uh, the personalities of the of the people that that uh, the stories are covering. I mean, for me, this story is really about sacrifice, and I think as you as the film sort of washes over you by the end, I think. Uh, there's an understanding of what Janet sacrificed to do something that no one uh, thought she could do, and a lot of people didn't want her to do. Yeah, no, that's true. And also the what could have been. That was one of the things after we had a screening um, last weekend in Tribeca, and a lot of the audience came up and said, oh, my God, what could have been had she been able to continue in the sport? And... Uh, I think that goes hand in hand. You get a little bit of heart and hurt and hope <laughs> from from this had, story. Had she started racing uh, Indy cars uh, five years earlier, even you, exactly. know, you never know. Exactly. But but I, I think you know uh, ESPN is thrilled. We're thrilled, um, and we're happy to see the story like this participate in the Thirty for Thirty uh, series, which is tremendous and has certainly been inspirational to me as a filmmaker and a sports lover. Uh, and I hope it does create more sports docs uh, or sorry racing docs Janet Guthrie qualified debuts 9 p.m. Eastern on ESPN here at the end of May Jenna Ricker Greg Store so appreciative of the time oh, you've please, taken thank here you for having us we're doing it in an authentic fashion too as folks can hear with the ambient That's noise in right. the background we're in we're at the Indy 500 there's press conferences in the back cars on track whizzing by look you guys did the beautiful studio stuff we're doing the gritty look this is more I love you know, it. commando style so appreciative for what you have created and I hope our friends at ESPN say yeah, maybe the racing 30 for 30 is a little bit light in that department. Why don't you guys come back with a few more ideas? Amen. You got it. Thank you so much. 
And that was Jenna Ricker and Greg Stewart from the documentary Qualified here on ESPN debuting Monday night at 8 p.m. Eastern. If you have the interest or ability, would definitely recommend watching this and adding it to a really strong recent population of motor racing documentaries. If this is your first time listening to the Marshall Pruitt Podcast, we do indeed have a brand new site, marshallpruittpodcast.com, where 500-plus episodes live and wait for your browsing. All right, I am Marshall Pruitt. This is the Marshall Pruitt Podcast, brought to you by Cooper Tires and the Justice Brothers. Thank you for listening.